Rogal Dorn's Imperial Fist Legion was absolutely vital to the defense of Terra during the Horus Heresy. Fighting on the walls of the Imperial Palace, through the trenches against their lost cousins, or amongst the stars defending the space of the Soul System, the Imperial Fists have earned their title as the Sentinels of Terra. With the Second Founding, all the many legions of the Great Crusade were broken into multiple chapters, as we well know. And I would argue that very few successor chapters bear as much lore and renown as those of the Imperial Fists. The Black Templars ranged through the Imperium on a perpetual crusade against the foes of the Emperor. The Crimson Fists stand resolute against endless green tides. The Imperial Fists themselves still hold the throne world as their primary charge. But there is another chapter, one with a curse that plagues their blood much in the same way that the Blood Angels are cursed. That chapter is the Excoriators, their armor a stoic white, but each one bearing a red fist of Dorn on their shoulder. Today we're going to go into the lore behind the Excoriators, their origins, their successes, their failures, and where they are today. Now they don't have the wide sweeping lore of many of the other Imperial Fist successors, but they do have a very interesting history, one that I'd like to share with you guys. They are really only mentioned in their own book, Legion of the Damned, and on, in addition to that, they are talked about the Legion of the Damned themselves, and then throughout the War of the Beasts series. Outside of that, they are rather obscure, and I think that, that makes them a great subject. Let's dive deep on the Excoriators, the Forgotten Sons of Dorne. The origins of this chapter span far back, beyond the current era, even before the second founding in which they were created. As Horus besieged the throne world of Terra, Rogal Dorn charged all the companies of the Imperial Fists to different tasks. Upon the battlements of the walls of the Imperial Palace, Rogal Dorn himself gave the Space Marines present one order. Do not lose. Holding the line no matter the cost, no matter the odds. This would be a mentality that would echo far into the chapter's history and become a hallmark of both their fighting style and physical appearance as you will soon discover. After the events of the Iron Cage, which we cover in the video on Rogal Dorn, a link in the upper right, Dorn broke his legion apart. He rewarded those that fought at the Imperial Palace with their own chapter, and granted their captain, Demetrius Catalfalk, the title of Chapter Master of the newly born Excoriators. Upon their founding, Rogal Dorn also granted the Excoriators with the Stig Martyr. This would act as the standard of the chapter as well as their badge. The red gauntlet gripping a thunderbolt would be etched onto the shoulder of every marine to come. In addition, the Excoriators would join the ranks of the Astartes Praces. The second founding comes after the conclusion of the Scouring, an Imperium-wide crusade to purge the traitorous elements from the galaxy. With all the traitor marines taking refuge in the Eye of Terror, the Astartes Praces was created to stand vigil over the Eye, defending the worlds around it and acting as the first line of defense against any invasions. Comprised of 20 space marine chapters, the Excoriators are one amongst their number that guard against the coming chaos incursions. The Excoriators' home planet of Ashara in the Segmentum Obscurus helps to lend credence to this fact, while I was unable to find out exactly where Ashara is on the map and its relation to the Eye of Terror, I can only assume that it's relatively close to the foreboding gateway of the Traitor Marine. But like all true Sons of Dorn, the Excoriators bear a great deal of resemblance to their brother chapters in their belief system, but at the same time, they have a marked number of differences as well. Chapter Master Kettlefock firmly believed in the same flagellation that Dorn had done to himself for penance and closeness to the Emperor. This morbid obsession with pain seeps its way into the many traditions of the chapter. The rites of castigation and the donning of Dorne's mantle are ways that the excoriators find themselves growing closer to their gene father. In fact, denying a battle brother from donning Dorne's mantle is a means of punishment for acts of laxity, breaching of protocol, or any action deemed unworthy of the ideals of the Primarch. The Excoriators consider the union to their Primarch through pain as a privilege that only those worthy are allowed. This sentence is then pursued by the company chaplain, who ensures that this punishment is carried out. As a whole, self-mutilation, scarring, form, any kind of form of evidence of battle or previously endured pain is heavily venerated across the chapter. 
so much so that disputes within the chapter are settled in a ritual known as the Trial by the Blade. Simply put, it is a duel with ceremonial weapons to first blood. Uh, but here's the catch. It has to be first blood drawn from the combatant's face. Otherwise, it doesn't count. So whoever draws first blood, of course, then wins whatever dispute that caused the trial to begin with. The excoriators wear these scars as a badge of honor, showing their dedication to Dorn, the Emperor, and the protection of the Imperium. Uh, one cannot win the day without getting their fists dirty. Which is a pun I just immediately regret making, I'm so sorry. But now, many Space Marine chapters venerate the Emperor, right? Uh, seeing him as, of course, the figurehead of the Imperium. But depending on the chapter, their veneration or that veneration can become straight worship. During the Great Crusade, the secular truth of the Imperium weighed heavily on forsaking religion as a construct of an unenlightened humanity of antiquity. Instead, the Imperium at the time put their faith in reason, science, explanation. The Emperor was simply human's best psyker, and not the divine figurehead of the Imperial Creed that he is in the current timeline. When we look at another of the Scions of Dorn, the Black Templars, at least in the current 8th edition lore, we see a chapter that is wholly devoted to the Emperor as a divine holy figure, wreathed in mystery that protects the worthy and punishes the sinful. The Excoriators, on the other hand, firmly believe that the Emperor is still human, and that he has psychic abilities far beyond any human to have or will ever exist, just not that he is divine. Now that's not to say that they are far from pious in their devotion to the Emperor, they still have their daily prayers and believe that the Emperor doth protect, but it's a different belief than him being a god. It's worth noting that the Excoriators also absolutely despise the Ecclesiarchy, uh, looking at it as a personal affront to the Emperor's pursuit of a secular truth, as well as the memory of their father, as well as all loyal Primarchs that fought to defend that ideal. Now, Even before going to battle, Excoriators will recite the Dextera Dornami, a ritual prayer with which kind of roughly translates to the right hand of Dorn. It, in Latin, that is nothing like that. But a formal salute between battle brothers is raising their right gauntlet, then touching their forehead, lips, and breastplate with one knuckle. A more informal greeting for a higher ranking officer might be to simply kiss their right gauntlet out of respect. Now, before I jump into how the chapter commits itself to war, I want to touch on something I mentioned in the opening of the video. The Curse of the Chapter's Bloodline. The Blood Angels have their Black Rage, which is essentially a member of the chapter lost in the final moments of their gene sire, believing that they are uh, Sanguinius himself, fighting against Horus. For the Excoriators, it's very much the same. Dorne's Darkness, as it is called, is a sort of comatose state that anyone of the chapter can fall into, at, at any point really. In this coma, or fugue, whatever you want to call it, the warrior feels all of the grief and all of the sorrow that Dorn felt upon discovering his broken brother and fallen father. The crippling emotion that overwhelmed the fortitude of a Primarch spills over the Marine as they stare into nothing, slack-jawed and eyes glazed over. Once they are brought back to the chapter's Master of Sanctity, they are given a sort of spiritual cure of sorts that either raises them from their state or gives them their final rest. A marine can come out of it at their own will as well as what it seems like from the lore. So we see something quite similar to the Black Rage in Dorne's Darkness as far as it extending to an imprint of tragic emotion from a gene sire, but also different in that the darkness does not always claim its victims like the Black Rage does. But this pursuit of pain that we talked about earlier also influences the way in which the Excoriators do battle. The Imperial Fists focus on holding a defensive perimeter using calculated counterattacks and fortifications, and the Black Templars use their religious zeal to constantly pressure the enemy. But the Excoriators have a different tactic. Remember, the legacy of this chapter extends back to the heavy war of attrition that was the siege on the Imperial Palace, and that method has made its way up to the current era. The Excoriators echo Dorne's final orders of do not lose by wearing down the enemy through prolonged wars of attrition. Pain is believed to be psychological for them, and being able to withstand injuries that would otherwise cripple even normal Marines allows the Excoriators to last through engagements many times over. Resilience 
is their chief virtue, as it were, enabling them to push on until their body physically cannot continue. Their deployment, usually with the aid of the Sisters of Battle or Imperial Army elements, allows them to form a concrete center that the other units can rally around, seeing their Adeptus Astartes allies never faltering in the face of overwhelming numbers. The reoccurring motif of self-mutilation as a means of expressing your devotion to the Primarch and the Emperor is repeated once more with the battle plate of the chapter. As the conflicts weather and beats down each battle brother, their plate is restored to its like just base functionality. Um, it's not made all pretty. I mean, they do not repaint their armor. They don't make it pristine like their cousins across the stars. Instead, they wear their wounds, dents, scrapes, and what have you like badges for each engagement. Each mark is accompanied by a date and location of where it was bore scrawled in black, a perfect contrast to the pristine white of their armor. This acts as a demoralizing tactic to the enemy as well. If a chapter who appears as if it has gone through hell is still standing to fight, what can you possibly do to them that's worse than what they've already seen? So unlike the polished veneer we see all marines, the excoriators appear as if they were fresh from the fight wherever they appear. This extends into neophytes as well, you know, who still have their pristine armor. It's considered dishonorable to the full-fledged battle brothers, but each marine has to earn their scars over time, and you can mark the veterancy of a member of the chapter simply by the battle damage across their plate. Now there's one last thing I want to go into before we cut into some of the lore, or at least notable actions of the chapter, and that is the Feast of Blades. Now I swear to God, I'm not talking about an unreleased book by George R. R. Martin here. Instead, the Feast of Blades, yet again, spans back to the time of the second founding. Rogel Dorn, ever the, you know, pragmatic individual, knew that he wanted to keep the brotherhood that bound the original Legion so tightly ever present in the chapters of his scions. The Feast of Blades was a grand tournament, spanning every Imperial Fist successor chapter in which they would supply 10 champions, who then all duel amongst the other chapter's champions. This would act as a means of cementing brotherhood, renewing oaths to one another, requesting aid on future crusades or current stalemates, and what have you. So this was a martial contest, sure, uh, but it absolutely had a diplomatic angle to it as well. In the most recent Feast of Blades, the Excoriators came out of the victor. It's up to the winning chapter to organize and host the next feast within 100 years of the last one. My favorite thing about how the Excoriators won is that their champion did not beat the champions of the Imperial Fists and the Black Templars by some amazing act of swordsmanship, something that the latter two chapters had in spades. Rather, it was the Excoriator's resilience and ability to fight on where their brother chapters just couldn't. Uh, the champion claimed the Sword of Dorn by outlasting the others, then committing to the winning blow when his opponents were all but spent. The Dorn's Blade is then granted to the winner. Oh, with a history, you guessed it, going back to the Horus Heresy, the Dorn's Blade, also known as the Sword of Sebastus after the planet in which the Imperial Fists fought the Iron Warriors in the famous Iron Cage, was created after Rogel Dorn shattered his previous sword in half. After discovering his father and his brother wounded and dead, he broke the sword that failed to protect the man he was sworn to guard. Until the champion of the 817th Feast of Blades is chosen, the blade is wielded by Zachariah Kirsch, the current chapter master of the Excoriators. Which actually segues well into the brief history we know of this obscure chapter. We've talked about the War of the Beast in our video on the Last Wall Protocol, which I might expand on in its own series, we shall see. It's a pretty dense subject. But the Excoriators joined up with the Scions of Dorne to reforge the Legion after the Imperial Fist's near destruction on Armatura. Chapter Master Issachar led the Excoriators during the 32nd millennium against Orc Wa Beast, all throughout the many engagements of that campaign. The Sons of Dorne fought alongside the Salamanders, shoulder to shoulder as brothers with the returned Primarch Vulcan, leading the charge on Wa Beast's home planet of Ulanor Prime. The chapter's excellence then extends to engagements against the traitorous legions across the sectors surrounding the Eye of Terror, typically stationed where they can win via wars of attrition versus their corrupted cousins. Chapter Master Kesaya Ichabod, reputed to be one of the best excoriators to have ever lived, was slain in an ambush planned by the Alpha Legion. 
leading the Honored First, the chapter's first company, filled with veterans, of course, they were sent to inspect and relieve a garrison of excoriators from Ignis Prime. Once they arrived on the planet, the Alpha Legion sprung their trap, destroying almost the entirety of the first company, save two individuals. This also led to the capture of the Stig Martyr, the, ca the chapter's famous standard, personally bestowed upon them by Rogaldorn himself. While the Alpha Legion was unable to directly slay Master Ichabod, they were able to poison him, and the poison, with no cure knowing, known to the chapter, was able to kill him across a number of agonizing days. The two individuals that made it out of Ignis Prime were the Santiarch Balshazar and Chapter Scourge Zechariah Kirsch. Scourge in the Excoriators is a title that means the Chapter's Champion. Uh, it's called the Emperor's Champion in the Black Templars, for example. And this was seen as a massive disgrace for Kirsch, as he fell victim to Dorne's darkness and was unable to save his charge, the Chapter Master. Locked in prison for his grand failure and ultimate crime, Kirsch's end seemed a foregone conclusion. But before Ichabod could succumb to the poison, he charged Captain Shiloh Gideon with taking Kirsch and nine other champions to attend the Feast of Blades. Master Ichabod knew how low the morale of the chapter was, and he charged the captain with winning at all costs. Kirsch, again disgraced, was also still the best champion of the chapter, and as we mentioned earlier, was able to win the 816th Feast of Blades becoming the first excoriator to ever win the Doran's Blade. Reinstated to duty and assigned a company once more, Zachariah Kirsch led the excoriator's fifth company in the defense of the Imperial Cemetery world of Sirtis Minor. There they joined the elements of the Sisters of Battle and the planet's Imperial Guard Regiment, the Sertusian Charnel Guard, to defend against a massive invasion from the forces allied with the Chaos God Korn. This is a doozy of a name coming up. But the Collar Cost Blood Crusade looked to sweep through the system, using the Blood Red Keeler Comet as a means to guide them all the way to Holy Terra. Their first stop was Sirtis Minor. Curse sent out a distress signal to all Imperial elements around the planet, asking for aid. From the Angels, Eradicant, to even their brothers in their Imperial Fists, no one could answer the call as they were all readying their defenses for the oncoming Blood Crusade. Kirsch sent their gene seed reserves as well as their chief apothecary away from the engagement in a crippled strike cruiser, hoping to at least preserve the means of producing future generations of excoriators. The cornate tide broke upon the defenders as the excoriators enacted ingenious tactical strategies to break beachheads before they were established and repel the enemies from weak points in the defense. Assault after assault, the enemy was beaten back with more Imperial lives being claimed with each wave of slaughter. No one could predict the sheer amount of souls that Korn had willed to this grand blood crusade, and the defenses were overrun. To a man, the excoriators fell, each one making the enemy pay for every step trod upon Imperial soil. Surrounded and alone, Corpus Captain Zachariah Kirsch threw out one final prayer to the Emperor, asking for aid, asking for deliverance. And it came in the form of the enigmatic Legion of the Damned, a mysterious chapter that has long since been lost to the warp, but still emerges at times of extreme need to aid Imperial war efforts before disappearing in the same stroke. The Legion of the Damned single-handedly fought back the Cornate Tide and destroyed the Keeler Comet, thus ending the Collar Cost Blood Crusade and saving Zachariah Kirsch's life, who would then go on to become the Chapter Master of the Excoriators. As we draw this video to a close, I hope you discovered a little bit about a chapter that is hardly mentioned in comparison to the grand shadow that the other three successor chapters of the Sons of Dorne cast. There is another chapter, the, the Fists Exemplar, but I decided not to go into detail about them too much as it would segue us far, far off course. But by the end of the War of the Beast, they had fully absorbed into the newly reformed Imperial Fists chapter. The Excoriators continued their fight for the Imperium, with the Noctis Aeterna sweeping through the galaxy and the Imperium split asunder with the Sassatrix Maledictum, the Adeptus Praesis' objective is now a bit more challenging. Nevertheless, the Excoriators deployed eight of their companies against Abaddon and his 13th Black Crusade. They still fight at the forefront of battles where all hope seems lost, and only the resilience that is born of the Forgotten Sons of Dorne can prevail. 
I want to thank you guys so much for joining me in this video here today. Originally, when I sat down to do this, I had expected it to be quite a short video, but I found myself getting very engrossed in the details of this chapter. From the battle plate inscribing to the Feast of Blades, there's just kind of, there's, there's so much rich history in such a small package in the Excoriators. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed telling you the story. Um, it has one of the most frustrating chapter names to pronounce because it's not a real word. It just kind of means like the excoriation I know of, but not excoriators. So it was a very, very weird word to pronounce over and over and over. But I have another Imperial Guardsman video coming out next week, and I'll be soon starting on an Eldar series. But if there's any other little offshoot chapters or nuggets of information you'd like me to pursue, go ahead and leave a comment below. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.